Good morning. And welcome. Welcome to St. Mark Lutheran Church on this Transfiguration Sunday. Um, just that I, I have a, a number of things that I, I, I definitely need to share with you. Um, certainly today, we remember in the prayers of the church, the precious young lives of Alexandria Werner, Brian Frazier, and Ariel Anderson. Um, it has uh, come to my attention that uh, some of you uh, have been approached by people outside the building looking for some kind of financial assistance. Would you be so kind when you encounter such folk if you would just direct them to the pastor? I have a PhD in discerning the truth. All right, never mind. All right. So, okay, um, you know that not everybody is really hungry. You know that, right? Okay, just wanted to make sure. All right, some are, but not everybody. All right. Um, Wednesday, Ash Wednesday services at ten and seven. This should be something that every Christian, everyone who names the name of Jesus, who takes the name of Jesus Christ, should be present. Um, no one's that busy. No one. And that's why we open the doors wide as we can. If you can't make it at night, there's the morning. If you can't make it in the morning, there's the, the evening time. But it is important. It really sets the tone for our Lenten our, our Lenten journey. Um, Tuesday is Shrove Tuesday. We bury the Alleluia, and we gather, as has been a tradition at St. Mark for many, many years, to uh, eat pancakes and sausages. Now, I have not, I've looked, I have not let the Bible in there. But um, it's a tradition that I understand that goes all the way back uh, in England, just before the Lenten fast, People would go through their homes and clean out anything, all the fat, and all the eggs, and all the milk, and they came up with pancake dinners. So uh, I hope you'll take advantage of that and hope to see you on, on Tuesday. Most importantly this morning, we wanted to extend our sympathies to the, to the family of David Bankus on the passing of his sister, Susan Day. Um, funeral services have not been arranged, but when arrangements are made, we will be sure to let you know. We also extend our sympathies this morning to the Andre family on the passing of Rich Sobieski, which was yesterday at, at home. So please remember the Andres, please remember the Bankuses in your prayers. Uh, undoubtedly a very, very difficult, difficult time. I know that there's a plan for a coffee hour next week during, right after this first service, and there are sign-up sheets at both doors if you would like to contribute something to that, to that time. So, I think that is all that I need to share with you. We take this time to prepare our hearts to worship.
Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who forgives all our sins, whose mercy endures forever. Amen. Let us come into the light of Christ, confessing our need for God's mercy. Holy and faithful God, I often choose my own way instead of yours. I think I can evade your commandments. I have spoken in ways that kill, strayed with my heart, betrayed friends, and hated enemies. I have broken my promises. Search me deeply and create me anew. Lift the heavy burden of my sin and free me to follow your way of life. Amen. Call upon me, says the Lord, and I will answer. Our God has come among us to loose every bond and to set us free from all that weighs us down. Receive the forgiveness of all your sins in the name of Jesus Christ, our crucified and risen Savior. Amen. have seen a great light, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Awesome God, we sing for joy to you, for you are our strength. We come joyfully to worship you, God, for you are our ever-present strength. When everything in our lives is going smoothly, you are our strength. When calamity strikes and life is hard, you are our strength. When we are happy and when sadness overwhelms us, you are our strength. We come in joy to worship you, God, 
for you are our ever-present strength. We pray the prayer of the day together. O oh God, God, in the transfiguration of your Son, you confirm the mysteries of the faith by the witness of Moses and Elijah, and in the voice of the bright cloud, declaring Jesus your beloved Son, you foreshadowed our adoption as your children. Make us heirs with Christ of your glory, and bring us to the joy of its fullness, through Jesus Christ our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God,
Transfiguration of our Lord Sunday, the first reading comes from Exodus, the 24th chapter. At Mount Sinai, Moses experienced the presence of God for 40 days and 40 nights. The glory of the Lord settled on the mountain, and on the seventh day, God called out to Moses. On the mountain, he gave Moses the, the stone template of tablets inscribed with the Ten Commandments. Now I'm reading. The Lord said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain and wait there, and I will give you the tablets of stone with the law and the commandment which I have written for their instruction. So Moses set out with his assistant Joshua, and Moses went up into the mountain of God. To the elders he had said, Wait here for us until we come to you again, for Aaron and Hur are with you. Whoever has a dispute may go to them. Then Moses went up on the mountain, and the cloud covered the mountain. The glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it for six days. On the seventh day, he called to Moses out of the cloud. Now the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on the top of the mountain in the sight of the people of Israel. Moses entered the cloud and went up on the mountain. Moses was on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. We read responsibly Psalm 2. Why are the nations in an uproar? Why do the peoples mutter empty threats?
according to St. Matthew, the 17th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus took with him Peter and James and his brother John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became dazzling white. And suddenly there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three dwellings here, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them. And from the cloud a voice said, This is my son, the beloved. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell to the ground and were overcome by fear. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Get up and do not be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them, Tell no one about the vision until after the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Unfortunately, this day, Transfiguration Sunday, is forever melded in my mind with an image that is, I guess, not all that holy or spiritual. Um, an experience many years ago in Yosemite, in California, high up on a, on a, on a mountain, back and forth, going up, going up, going up, and we were a considerable way up this, this mountain, Karen and myself. And of course, the people around us were outfitted with the latest hiking gear. Boots from the Bass Pro Shop. They had the poles and everything, which I have always found annoying, by the way. I just go, oh, the heck with this. But anyway, there we were high up on the mountain. And all these people with their official hiking gear. And what comes around the corner? But a lady, an older woman, she had high heels on. And she had her purse like this, and she's just hobbling along. And I just remember looking in the contrast between the way she was dressed and prepared or not prepared and all of the other people. I thought to myself, she must have got up and said, I'm either climbing a mountain or going to the mall. That's what I saw. <laughs> the scriptures declare, if you have ears, well then hear. Speaking of ears, I had a dear, dear friend, probably my best friend the first few years of, of elementary school, and his name was Dean. And I have many Dean stories, and all of them are true. But Dean, Dean stood out. Dean was in kindergarten. He was an absolutely imposing figure, towering over us like a mighty oak. I marveled at his size. I shuddered at the thought of his, of his power unleashed upon us, but he was a dear gentle and a sweet soul. And I will confess this morning that in direct contradiction of the Tenth Commandment, I coveted, I coveted his Batman lunchbox. <laughs> now aside from his stature and his gap-toothed smile, the thing, one of the things that you noticed about him, the characteristic that probably drew the most incredulous stare, were the ears connected to the sides of his head disproportionately large, shall we say. Not exactly dumbo size, but uh, pretty big. And the reason for the anomaly I came to understand was his mother. It wasn't genetic. It was the fact that in order to get his attention, she would regularly reach out and pull on him. She would go, you're not listening. And she would say it very tenderly. If you have ears, well then listen. A writer laments the fact that as we grow and we make our way through the educational process, we receive training on how to read, how to write, how to speak. But he laments that scant attention is paid to a skill that is just as essential. And that is listen. And we pay the price for it. We pay for the price in busted relationships, in fractured homes, in broken deals, looking, looking in the mirror, he says. 
I'm reminded again and again that I have one mouth and that I have two ears. And then he goes on to say, is it a possibility that perhaps God is saying something to me, to all of you, all of you, about what the ratio should be in terms of listening to speaking? Let it be known here on Transfiguration, on the edge of Lent. I resolve to listen twice as much as I shoot my mouth off. If you have ears, then hear. There are many things about Jesus' life that stand out. But I think what is instructive for us today is the pattern that characterized the breathless pace of his ministry. Now, in terms of the pace of his ministry, it depends on whose chronology you accept or take as your guide. If you look at the synoptics, Jesus' ministry was probably about two and a half years. Two and a half years. If you listen to the Gospel of John, it's, it's a whirlwind one-year ministry. If you look at his life, there were intense periods of activity followed by withdrawal. A flurry of healing, a torrent of word promptly followed by an exodus to an empty place, to the wilderness. And there in the midst of the lonely place, Jesus rested in the presence of his Father. He broke free from the tyranny of words and he listened. Sometimes the Bible says he would listen, he would rise a great time before day, and in other times he would spend the whole Which I do not take to or understand is just filling the air with words, but silence and listening. No other one around, save the moaning of the wind. I know this is hard for some of you to believe. No phone, even. He didn't have a phone. As I said, the pattern of his life, this retreat into silence, is instructive for us because more than that, we, the challenges and the assumptions about what is actually real in the world. I have become more and more conscious, more aware and sensitive to the fact that the truth is that the world says that what you are doing at this moment right now, many people would say to you, is really just an escape. It's just a kind of avoidance. That really what we need to do is just grow up and, and face the facts. That you and I have been cast into existence, into a world that refuses to make any sense at all. Think about last Monday at MSU in Lansing. A world that refuses to make any sense. And the sooner you realize it, and the sooner that you realize that you are truly alone, and that there is no one watching over you, and there is no happy place to go when you die. This is reality, they tell us. This is reality. Your ascent, Jesus says, up the mountain puts you in a good place to be touched by what is real. In a moment of prayer, the reading of God's word, the moves and the structure of a sermon, the notes and the words of a song, the touch of bread and wine. All of these are ways in which we are touched by what is real. So listen, listen carefully, intently, because God in his subtlety might draw back the curtain and we will be given a glimpse of another world as God did on a mountaintop with Peter and James and John so long ago. In a blinding flash of light, Moses and Elijah rise from the depths of history past. They rise from eternity. And they stand by Jesus. And they affirm his life, the direction of his life, the purpose of his life, as he makes his way down, down the hill, down the mountain, into the heart of suffering and of death. In the twinkling of an eye, in the span of a brief moment, the glory of God is clearly unmistakably seen in the face of Christ. The voice thunders and it ratifies the affirmation that we heard just a few weeks ago. This is my son. Listen to him. 
I'm sure within this room this morning, the question arises, or actually the question should arise in your mind. Of all the things and of all the people to listen to in the world, why do we listen to Jesus? Why not someone else? That is a good question and a fair question which warrants a sincere and honest answer. Why, of all the voices in the world, why listen to Jesus? The fact of the matter is, as everyone in this room knows, there are countless voices to pay, to pay heed to and to follow. In fact, that's probably what makes it so difficult to listen. A cacophony of voices, of competing claims for truth that seem at times too numerous to count. So in the, interest, in the interest of toleration, we often say, well, they're all equal. They're, they're all equal. And they're all saying the same thing. And all roads lead to the same place. Let me tell you this morning, as someone who has a little experience with this, you try that with a, a, a devout Muslim. Try that with a devout Muslim or anyone else who is devout and committed to their faith. When you say that we're all ultimately saying the same thing, they would say, obviously, you have not taken the time to really understand what our faith does say. Because if you did, you wouldn't say that. I would point out to you this morning that when it comes to our faith, our tradition, when it comes to the scriptures, you are free all of you, to either accept or to reject it. But you are never free to make it say something that it never intended to say. And that being said, there is a particularity about the gospel that many find to be offensive. A precise and specific focus that many, as I say before, do not find to be pleasant at all. Matthew and Mark and Luke and John speak together here. God saved, chose this one and no other. There is no question that Buddha, there is no question that Muhammad and many others have spoken things that are true about life. That I would never deny. The Buddha begins his sermon at Benares, life is suffering. Anyone here want to take issue with that? Does anyone here want to take issue with that? Life is is suffering. The Buddha goes on to say, if you have ten loves, you have ten opportunities to suffer. If you have five things, the people that you truly love, whose life means more to you than your own, then there are five opportunities to, to suffer. And your job is to extinguish those things, to extinguish those desires. Jesus said, he who does not love is already dead. They're not saying the same thing. So don't say that. The truth we believe as Christians is that ultimately God is Christ. Secondly, it is foreshadowed in the text the glimpse of majesty in the face of Jesus which drives the disciples to their knees. It is a taste of eternity which will sustain them in the weeks, in the dark weeks, in the dark days ahead, in the despairing hours of a certain Friday afternoon. But with the rising of the sun will come new understanding and a mission if this Jesus that we saw die in agony and humiliation is now truly alive and in our midst, if he shares in God's eternal life and has the ability to share that life, if he has the power of the future, the power even the door to open the door wide to a, a new world for the likes of three young students at MSU, then this is not a tribal deity. This is not a private cult figure. This is the one and only Lord of the whole world. If you have ears, then hear. This is my son. Listen to him. Amen.
is one Lord, one faith, and one baptism, united in Christ. Let us confess the faith we hold in common in the words of the Nicene Creed found at the back of your communion. We believe in one God, the Father of the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified and under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures, he ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory of the judge of the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Sisters and brothers, we join our God of glory and of grace, you call us to wait upon your name. Give your church on earth the strength and the patience, the people you would have us to be. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Our loving God, you provide us with mercy and love through your beloved Son. Shine the light of his love to feed the hungry, to comfort those who and to heal the sick. We remember before you this morning especially Jim Romzik and Bible, John Lipinski and Gary Held, Bob Hughes and Bev Gillick, Joe Slazinskis and Dave Garrett, Dave Gill, those who have been grievously wounded at MSU, and for others, as we now name them either out loud or in our hearts. Be with all who suffer, Lord, in your mercy. God of wisdom, give us the grace to walk the way of the cross with you. In times of challenge and disappointment and pain, help us to see them as opportunities to lean more fully upon you, to grow closer to you, to become more Christ-like. Help us to remember that your ways, unlike the ways of the world, give life and hope, Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Eternal Father, we place into your hands, into your care this day, those who grieve, grieve, those who have felt that pall, a thick pall of grief, fall upon their hearts. We remember today the family and the friends of Susan Day and Rich Sobieski. In their grief, Remind them again and again that they are not alone. Remind them that those that they love have not fallen into an abyss of nothingness, but into your arms. Lord, be your mercy. Yeah. Our Lord God, we confess this morning that we are sick in our hearts. These acts of evil visited upon people especially, the young and the innocent, those whose lives were filled with such promise, now stumped out the act of a madman. We remember today Alexandria Berner, Brian Frazier, Ariel Anderson, 
in this time of utter confusion and chaos, we turn to you and ask that those who love these people would find comfort and strength in you, not just in the days ahead, but in the years ahead. Grant to all of us here today strength and imagination and the sheer determination to face the myriad circumstances that create such situations. Give us the courage to act. Lord, in your mercy. And now in your hands, O oh Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you. And also with you. Pray. God of the abundant table, you have refreshed our hearts in this meal with bread for the journey. Give us your grace on the road, that we might serve our neighbors with joy, for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now God Almighty send you light and truth to keep you all the days of your life. The hand of God protect you, the holy angels accompany you, and the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen. Go in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.